passage that we've, we've had on the book of Galatians in the first chapter. And we're continuing and focusing on the theme that the Apostle Paul is, is developing here as to the character of the message and his apostolic ministry as he's speaking to the Galatian church about the uniqueness and the divine origin of the gospel. Verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea that were in Christ, but they were hearing only that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. So here the Apostle Paul continues to set forth the unique character of the message of the gospel by pointing out that just as this message speaks to us of a salvation which only God secures, which only comes from God, so it is that the message itself, the inception of it in Paul's life and his own ministry is something that comes entirely from God. The message speaks of the miracle of salvation. And the miracle of salvation is that it is a work of God alone. It is not something we help God to do in our lives. Salvation is supernatural. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a true ministry of the Holy Spirit producing real spiritual fruit that is not sourced or conditioned upon anything in me. That is why the Christian life is so glorious. It is supernatural. It's not from this world. It's from the Lord himself and from heaven. It's the life of God expressing itself, himself, in the lives of his people. And in the same way, the message which bears this good news of the gospel, of the salvation that comes from God, this message itself comes from God. This message itself is not the collective result of a survey or an opinion poll or a collection of astute theologians who get together and decide that this is what the gospel is really all about. This message is something that is the result of God's power revealing himself in a way that would otherwise not have been possible for man. The salvation that God expresses in the lives of his people is impossible on ourselves or in our own flesh, in our own conditions. So the message that speaks about this salvation comes in such a way that there is no question that it must be God and God alone who gives this message. And Paul wants to set this forth by his own example to the Galatians, not just to tell them about his story. He's not inter interested in just telling them about his experience as an apostle. He is telling them this 
so that they can also learn from what has happened to him and how God set him apart to be an apostle and a preacher of this gospel about the gospel itself. He's instructing them as to the character of this message, which is set in opposition to the message of the Judaizers. Now, we've said over the past several weeks as we've looked at this passage that the message of the Judaizers at the time when Paul wrote this book was a message that sought to add a condition which man must perform that made salvation salvation. And essentially, the Judaizers looked, talked, acted, smelled, I mean, in every way appeared like true preachers of the gospel, except that they sought to add something that man must do as the decisive element for salvation. And there are many today, as we have said, who preach the gospel, as it's, as, as it's, who open up the scriptures, who talk about the cross, who talk about the resurrection, who talk about the Christian life, who talk about the hope of heaven, who talk about forgiveness, who talk about righteousness, and then after all of that, say, but you need to do X, Y, Z. You still need to exercise your free will. You still need to get on board and bring your part of it to the Christian life. You still need to something, whatever it might be. And the whole idea of a condition that comes from us, which makes our Christian lives what they are, or a condition that we fulfill that enables us to get saved, that whole idea is the same doctrine that the Apostle Paul denounced in the Judaizers. So it's still around today. And we've said that the most common, common uh, doctrinally clear statement of it is found in what we would call Arminianism or Evangelical Arminianism, the doctrine that says that God loves everybody. He wants to save everybody. He's done everything he can. He's done his part. He really, really wishes that everybody would come to him, but he cannot do the one thing that brings about the salvation that he otherwise has potentially given to everyone, and that is he cannot do the choosing or the accepting for you. And if you're going to be a Christian, you are going to have to exercise your free will and make what God has done through Jesus Christ a reality by your faith. And once that happens, then you are a believer, and then what has occurred in your life has made the Lord Jesus Christ sacrifice a reality for you. And so this teaching, this doctrine, that God loves everybody, wants to save everybody, and that what makes a person a Christian ultimately is something that they do by their free will, is a teaching that really amounts to salvation by works. Salvation according to man's effort. Salvation according to man's moral ability. You say, well, where does that come from? How do you say that a person is saved according to their moral ability? Well, if one person here has an equal advantage to this person here for salvation, if God has done exactly the same thing for this person as he has for that, and this person uses their advantage, uses that ability that God has given them to choose Jesus Christ and to accept him, and this person does not, then what's the difference between them? The difference is that one person has used their moral ability, has exercised it, has seen their need, and the other person has chosen to reject it, has not used what they have in common with this person, God loving both the same. So then what makes this person a Christian and this person not a Christian? Is it God? Is it what he has done? No, because God has done the same for all and God loves all the same. It is this person and this person's willingness and desire to exercise their moral ability where that person does not. And so this person is saved and forgiven because they have a savability and a forgiveness about them. But being savable and forgivable is not what makes us Christians. 
because there's not a single one of us that are savable and forgivable in ourselves. And the idea, the subtle idea that we can do something that brings about the conditions under which we become Christians, that we fulfill some condition of our free will, is not just a neutral uh, little indiscretion that we can pass over and say, well, this person needs to read more books. Maybe they should read John Calvin or something. That's not the issue. It's something that goes right down to the depths of our hearts. It goes down to the, the core of our being and the desire that we have, all of us, in our sin to exalt ourselves in our own righteousness and to see our own self-righteousness as the reason, finally and ultimately, for our relationship to God. So that we can all say, on the understanding of this false message, we can all say, like the Pharisee in the temple, I thank God that I am not like other men. See, We can give God all the credit, but at the same time be patting ourselves on the back. So it really does matter what you believe. It really does matter. And this doctrine that we call evangelical Arminianism is a doctrine that is so subtle because it's so accepted and so commonly understood and uses and traffics in all the language of Scripture. But it's a doctrine of demons. And it brings us into enslavement to our own righteousness. And so, remember last time when we, when we closed, we, we pointed out something that's very practical, I guess you could say, from our everyday experience. And we mentioned, in connection with the experience of the Apostle Paul here, and how he shows that his life went from religious zeal and concern for the traditions of his fathers in verse 15 to a desire for Christ and his righteousness and his gospel, and how this, his life was transformed because his other religious experience was based upon a condition of his own righteousness, his own self-interest, his own, what we would say, um, what we would call his own, his own self-righteousness. And, and the, the gospel brought him an understanding of the righteousness of Christ. And we pointed out the fact that all of us are Arminians by nature. All of us believe the false gospel, we might say, by nature in our sin. Because all of us want to think that we're better than we are. And all of us want to think that we can somehow do something to make God come our way. Or that we can keep God at a, at, on a leash, maybe, you know, and, and, and pull him in when we find him convenient for us. And kind of keep him on a loose leash when we don't really want him and, and, and so on. We, we all have that propensity in our sin to think that way. And that's the way that our sinful nature works. And I said at the end last time, do you know why you complain? And do you know why that you have bitterness in your heart toward other people? You say, well, what does that have to do with Galatians chapter 1? It has everything to do with it. Because the true gospel exposes us as people who in our complaining and in our bitterness that we harbor toward other people are people who are at the bottom of our existence. No matter what we call ourselves, we can call ourselves Reformed, we can call ourselves Christians, we can call ourselves whatever, we are self-righteous. Because when we complain about things that happen to us, when we bitterly complain or when we harbor bitterness against other people, and the things they have done to us, do you know what we're doing? We are saying, by our complaining, and by the bitterness of our hearts, we're saying, I deserve better. I'm getting a raw deal. This is not what I deserve. Yes, it is. It's much better than what you deserve. But the fact that you think you deserve better indicates that you have something in you that you believe should be rewarded by the providence of God. 
It indicates that you believe that you have something in you that you think God should recognize and reward with better conditions or better situations than you presently now have. And what might that be but the fact that you have a meritorious reason, you have a cause in yourself for the kindness of God. A person who is subject to bitterness and complaining believes that they have a cause in themselves for the kindness of God that's being violated by the providence of God. And do you know what that is? Self-righteousness. And only the true gospel can attack our self-righteousness and humble us and break our hearts. Only the true gospel can expose us and show us that you can assemble the worst of all conditions and you can place them in my life and I, in the face of those conditions, cannot complain against those conditions because I come to be aware because of the true righteousness of Jesus Christ that I deserve far worse in the judgment of God because of my own sin and my own self-interested contempt for what God has done by Jesus Christ. But the false gospel actually appeals to self-righteousness because the false gospel actually rewards the idea in people that they have something in themselves that deserves or that can be the cause of the kindness of God. Do you want to know what the only cause of the kindness of God is? God. God is the cause of his own kindness. I did not cause his mercy and kindness toward me. He did. I did not bring it about by some kind of whistle, some religious call that I uttered from my lips and brought him to me. He himself brought it about by his effective purpose in glorifying his name by my salvation through the work of Christ. But when I think I have a cause in me for the kindness of God, I am a ripe candidate, as we all are, you see, for the false gospel, because I can be told that God loves everybody. He wants to save everybody. And, you know, I can hear in my assumption that I am the cause of the kindness of God. I can hear that and I can think, well, that makes perfect sense to me. Even while I'm willing to say that there are people that go to hell, it makes perfect sense to me to believe that there's a God who loves people but whose love is so ineffective and so tepid and so absolutely unable to do what it desires and expresses to do that it can't keep a sinner out of hell. But that doesn't bother me because I like that kind of tepidity in God and that ineffectiveness in the love of God because God, after all, is my employee. He's at my beck and call. When I want to get spiritual, I'll pray a little bit, read my Bible. God will be happy with that. I like that. My flesh likes it. Because I believe in the core of my being that I'm the cause of the kindness of God. And it doesn't bother me at all that God should love everyone and not be able to save most of the people that he loves. After all. It's like the air we breathe, isn't it? We can pick it up and put it down whenever we want the love of God. But the false gospel teaches that this love of God, which is uni universally expressed to all sinners and doesn't save them, is something that solicits 
my cause, my power, my will, and that I am flattered and won over by it, and so that when I choose God, it's a tribute to my own religious discrimination. And that's why a person who's under the spell of the false gospel, if you say to that person, did you know that God does not love everybody? And did you know that God has predestined some to eternal life and has predestined others to eternal damnation? That immediately there is a violation that occurs in their thinking. It would be the same violation that would occur in our thinking if our hearts had not been broken and we had not been made to see that all of us deserve to be cast away forever and that we deserve to be condemned and forsaken by God because of our sin. But it brings about a violation. And what does that violation express itself like? Something like this. It's not fair. Somebody would not even have a chance that God would choose somebody before they're even born, that he would decide to hate one and love the other, and Jacob and Esau, before they're even born. It's not fair that God would create someone for the purpose of destroying them. That's not fair! Why isn't it fair? Because we all deserve an opportunity, don't we? And why do we deserve an opportunity? Well, because we're God's special creatures made in His image. He loves us. You see, the false gospel can only put a band-aid on our complaining and our bitterness and our lack of forgiveness and love and can make us into religious hypocrites. Hi, how are you? Great. Good. Um, have a good day? Yes, great. Wonderful. Good to see you. Good to see you too. That's all the false gospel can do. It can't address our real need to be broken hearted and to forgive, be tender-hearted toward one another, forgiving one another, as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us, because we don't understand forgiveness. We don't understand forgiveness if our hearts have not been truly broken by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we have stopped thinking that we have something in us that is the cause of the kindness of God. And so Paul, when he sets forth the character of his ministry does it not just because he wants the Galatians to be theologically accurate. He does it because he sees the effect of sin and the result and the fruit and the works of the flesh that are taking over in the Galatian church because they're believing this false gospel. They're believing this gospel that conditions salvation on the sinner instead of on the work and righteousness of Christ. And the church is filled with sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, dissensions, factions, and the like. It's not filled with it, but it certainly is manifesting itself among the church. And these works of the flesh, these attitudes that really are expressions of the fact that I deserve better, and I want better, and I'm going to get it, because I have a reason and a right to deserve it and to expect it, because I have a righteousness in me that I should expect, God should recognize and reward. You see? Paul addresses by the truth of the gospel and he says that the message which the Judaizers sow among you, and you look at that in, in chapter 5, is yielding this bitter fruit. And this bitter fruit can only be remedied by or can be attacked by a clear declaration of his truth in contrast to the lie. And this declaration of his truth he represents in his own ministry and call as an apostle. And that's a lengthy, I know, a very lengthy introduction. Um, but uh, he is representing it to them in this fashion because he has more than just a concern to make them theologically accurate people. His concern is that they might know the truth of Christ and they might be protected from the lie of Satan. And that's the concern we must have. We must never suppose that the issue that we talk about here with the gospel is an issue of being smart and having a better understanding of 
So the scriptures, then some poor bloke down the road who's dragging his knuckles along the ground because he doesn't know as much as we do. It's a concern that runs right to the heart of eternally significant things. Life or death matters that affects the way that we live. It affects whether we live our lives in bitterness and, and uh, divisiveness and complaining and, and unkindness and a lack of forgiveness toward each other or that we live a life of humility and grace that comes from a recognition of the forgiveness, the true mercy that we have been given in Jesus Christ. And so Paul says in verse 15, When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. He makes the point repeatedly throughout this section that his receiving of the message and his growth and understanding and preparation for the preaching of the message did not come through some kind of a vote of consensus, some kind of a, an appeal to the opinions of men, but it came by the supernatural activity of God. And he teaches us, therefore, about the character of the message, that it's a doctrine not from men or my men, it's a doctrine from God. And it's revealed by him in a way that would not be possible on any human terms. And Paul shows the supernatural way he received it. He didn't even confer after he received this message and after the Lord revealed his son in him with flesh and blood. He said, nor in verse 17, did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and then later returned to Damascus. And he details his history for the Galatians so that they can know that the authority that he bears among them is the authority of God himself because he has the message of God that is not the result of a vote by a committee. It's a message that is self-authenticating and has an authority that it bears in and of itself for the salvation of his people. And Paul is pointing their attention to that by going into such detail about his history. And then verse 18 he says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. Now, even now, when he says he met with Peter, now Peter by that time had been an apostle for, for, for some time, certainly, and was uh, known by the other apostles. But even at that time, he wants to make it plain that he did not enter into some kind of extensive relationship to the rest of the apostles. He said, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. And afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea that are in Christ, but they were, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith, or preaches the faith, which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. And so the point that he makes in this section is that this message which he received from God was the same message that the apostles believed and that the churches in Judea believed, but it was given by God in such a fashion that he, now receiving it, now hearing it, now learning it from the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming it, sees that it is in perfect agreement with what the apostles had themselves received from Christ and what the churches believed. Now, this is the glory of the message. You can be here in Coopersburg and be talking about the message of God's grace. And then you can travel across the other side of the world to Kunming, China, like I did this last year, and meet with somebody there who lives over there, far away, but who has the scriptures and who's heard the gospel, and he believes the same thing, the same message, not exposed to the same teachers, but exposed to the teacher, the word of God, the scriptures, the Holy Spirit's ministry. And we know the truth of this message, and it is confirmed in us, not because of men or the opinions of men. That's what Paul is saying here. And he's demonstrating it from his own example as an apostle. But we know this message because of God and the working of God. That's why we have an unmovable confidence in the truth of this message that we speak about. It did not come because of a seminary education. It did not come because we read a lot of theology books. 
It did not come because a bunch of people said, well, this is the way we should believe. It came because of a conviction that was supernaturally produced by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God itself, through the Scriptures. That's how it came. And that's how it comes to each and every believer in Jesus Christ. You become convinced with the Apostle and the conviction that he has himself and conveys to the church in Galatia, you become convinced that this message, this gospel, is not something that comes from man. And you didn't receive it from any man. But the Lord himself has revealed it to you by the power of his Holy Spirit. And it is something that you could not, apart from the power of his Holy Spirit, possibly believe. Because it's not based upon man. Now, what is the significance of what I've just said for the issue that we face, the, the matter of the true versus the false gospel, and uh, the question that swirls around us about the issue of Arminianism, for example, and, and uh, the tolerance of Arminianism? Well, simply put, it is this. We become convinced with a conviction that is not ours. And because it's not ours, it's not ours to give away. Did you just hear what I said? We become convinced with a conviction that's not ours. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It's God's work. And because it's not ours, it's not ours to give away. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says about the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we receive the Holy Spirit in verse 12. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given us from God. It says that we receive the Spirit that we might what? Know the things that have been freely given us by God. If we know the things that have been freely given us by God, by the Holy Spirit, and someone else comes along and they say, well, I don't believe these things. Are we to say that you believe things, even though you don't believe the things that I am convinced were given to me by the Holy Spirit, that you believe things by the same Spirit that I have received? If we do that, then we give away what's not ours to give away. It doesn't belong to us. We don't have the right to trade away the gospel on the altar of someone else's religious sincerity. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that salvation is all of grace. It's no works. It's the work of Christ. It's nothing that we do in our free will. It's nothing that we can fulfill and, and can bring about by anything that we, we ourselves bring to the table with God. But God, by the power of his message, breaks our hearts and causes us to see our need for true righteousness. And we come to understand that and we realize that the Lord Jesus alone is the concern that we must have and that his righteousness alone is what prevents and keeps us from sin and that his life is the concern that alone that gives us that by which we can come to God and that by which we have any hope of his forgiveness and favor. And so that when a person says, yes, I believe all of that, but I still believe I need to do something or I don't believe that God uh, picks and chooses between people or, or I, I think that God looks ahead and sees that who are going to choose him and who are, who are not and then chooses the ones that are going to or something like that. When we come across a person like that who's confessing a doctrine like that, we don't say to that person, you believe the same thing I do. If we do, then we're trading away what God has given to us. And we're saying, as much as saying that this is what, not what God has given to us, but it's something that I have developed over my own flesh, my own study, so I'm willing to tone it down a little bit so that you can get on board with me. It's like this. God in the great salvation he's given us has given us something that we don't have the right to say is incidental to what it means to be a Christian, but he's given us something in the confession of his grace that is the heart and soul of what it means to be a Christian. And uh, that's why the question of my allowing for the confession of others who don't acknowledge the true grace of God but believe in the false gospel is so, is so powerful, it's so important, because it involves, a, it involves an issue in my life in which I am confronted with the fact that 
I have to acknowledge, did I receive this conviction from God or not? And then I have to ask this question, does God give this conviction to everybody? And if I answer yes to that question in both cases, which I have no biblical warrant not to, I cannot say that a person who doesn't confess the grace of God with me, without conditions, is confessing the same grace of God. I can't. And maybe in my flesh I would like to. I don't want people to think I'm a nut. I don't want people to think I'm weird. I don't want people to think that I'm a hyper-Calvinist, whatever that means. I would love to have people think that I'm just a gracious, kind, accepting person that wants everybody to know how loving I am and so on and so forth, and they would love me for it. But you see, I would be giving away something that I can't give away because the gospel Paul, rece Paul received was not his to give away. And it's not mine to give away either. It's a precious gift. A precious gift that he secures by his power and by his blood. And because of that, it bears all the characteristics of God and not John Pedersen. Hallelujah. And it depends upon God and not me. Praise God for that. And therefore, I can't say that the conviction of his unqualified grace is something incidental to my relationship to God any more than Paul would say that the character of his ministry or the message which he preached came in some fashion or was conditioned in some fashion upon his relationship to the other apostles. Because it came from the same God, all the apostles agreed. And because this message that we speak about of God's grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, fulfilling the conditions of God's righteousness and going to the cross and bearing the punishment of his people there on the cross, and then applying the benefits that he secures by his sacrifice to the lives of his people through the power of his Holy Spirit. I cannot say that this message, that this truth, that this precious reality that I have and acknowledge by the grace of God is something incidental to what it means to be a Christian. I must believe with Paul that I did not receive it from man, that it did not come as the result of of a theological examination or a theological sophistication, but that I received it by the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and therefore I shall not, by the grace of God, show contempt for the Holy Spirit by saying to somebody else who doesn't believe this message that they believe the same Christianity I do. And that's what gets me into trouble. And that will get you into trouble too. But... That's what all Christians experience in this world, is trouble. And that's why church is such a wonderful time, because we're come together, you know, and, and we're communing and fellowshipping in this precious message that gets us into so much trouble <laughs> in the world, but that is such a comfort to our souls, because we know that it isn't from us. And so Paul teaches us by detailing his history before his public ministry something that we all by the work of the Holy Spirit can identify with in the conviction God gives us by the truth of this righteousness that Jesus Christ has fulfilled in his sacrificial death of this work that he has given to us and produced in us by the gift of his spirit breaking our hearts taking away our complaining and bitterness melting us before him and causing us to be beggars before him instead of people who want to negotiate our salvation. God, in his grace, speaks to us, as well as the Church of Galatia, with the unique character of the message and what it produces, the conviction it brings. And he comforts us and assures us that this message bears the stamp of divine authority because only by the gospel are we truly convicted of the lie that we all believe by nature that there is something in me that is the cause of the kindness of God. Let's pray.